Hi, welcome to the second episode of Yikes. Today I have Kendra Schwartz. Say hi, Kendra. Hey, thanks for having me. And today we have like a slightly more serious topic and we are talking about failures in being an ally. So Kendra, do you want to start with your story? Sure. This is like a specific seasonal one I was thinking of because Halloween's only in a few days. Somebody was asking me recently about like what cultural appropriation looks like in the Halloween season. And I was thinking back to when I was way younger and um, all I wanted to be was Saka Julia for Halloween. And I was like, this is a good idea. There's going to be no social repercussions for this. And so I like put together this like what I see now as like the most offensive costume I could have put together. I had like everything that you would hate, like the uh, feather, like in the back of like my thing. And I had like a dress that was like clearly like taken from Native American culture and like those like fringe boots that are just like awful, like everything you see that's bad at a music festival. And I just put it all together and I was like, now I understand this culture. Um, And I think like at the time I was like, this is fine because I want to be this character. And I really, really like the story of like Lewis and Clark. And I didn't want to be like Lewis or Clark, even though that would have been like probably a better choice at the time. But that's what I wanted to be then. And I dressed up in that costume and I was super excited about it. And no one ever told me that like that was a bad thing. But like now looking back, I'm like, this was super bad. And like someone should have called me out for it. And I'm sure there was people at the time who were like looking at me like, like people of Native American descent, I'm sure were looking at me like, okay, this is bad. Like we love you, but like, don't do this. And I definitely had friends like at the time who were Native American and like, probably felt too uncomfortable to say something but it was like totally stealing their culture but I was like eight when this happened I had like not the slightest idea that I was doing something wrong but when I was in like third grade I dressed up as a geisha for Halloween Mm -hmm. I didn't even like get creative with my outfit I just like went on the internet and like ordered the costume (laughs) which like they shouldn't be selling that in the first place (laughs) and so I had like the white face makeup and I had the like kimono and I look back and I'm like, oh, oh no. And I even had like this like short like black wig. It was very, very bad. But like a slightly, I don't know if this is worse or if this is like slightly more okay. <laughs> but like I was in Aladdin, which like I was in Cabot. And Cabot has basically all white people. And our dance studio did Aladdin one year. And I remember thinking that that was going to be an issue from the very beginning because I was like, we're all white. And my character was like this Muslim lady who like I had everything covered up, like all my arms and everything. And I was wearing the, uh, the full body thing. I don't remember what it's called, but I had like my hijab on. Mm -hmm. And I remember we had a, like we were doing a competition in a convention center And there was this gathering of Christian people. And I, like, walked through the Christian gathering wearing my hijab and everything. And people were, like, staring at me, like, who are you? What are you doing? And I think, looking back, that that wasn't good. We had, like, the whitest possible person playing Jasmine. It was really yikes. See, I always wonder that with, like, Disney princess costumes. So, like, I feel like there is a way to take on Disney princess costumes that are like not your race but like it has to be done in such a like very specific way and I think it's like really tough to know like where that line is so like if you're gonna be Mulan like a lot of it like basically the entire movie is like dealing with the cultures like how is there I don't know how you would like take that on and like Jasmine it's the same situation I feel like Tiana is like a different story because she has like a normal like princess dress that's like not really necessarily like part of culture besides like maybe New Orleans culture yeah they didn't pick like a specifically New orleans dress for her though yeah it's just like the classic princess dress which I think is nice like their black girls should be able to like look up to somebody and like wear that pretty dress yeah but also like if you're white and trying to be a Disney princess there are so many white right, ones that exactly. you can do just pick one of those and I think that that is the main issue that people have with it is that we already have so many most role characters models are white yeah. most characters and we choose the ones that are like specific to them when I was in high school we did Peter Pan 
and they double cast the role of Tiger Lily and like separated into oh. Tiger and Lily. Dude, when I was in theater, man, they did the same thing. Two white girls. It was hilarious. One of them was a black girl, but like she's still not Native American. Right. And one of them was very much white. And so like neither yeah. one of them were like appropriately cast. And I've had people cast like Asian people as Native American characters, oh. which is still like I feel like that's also bad. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've seen them do that same sort of thing with like interchanging Hispanic and black people. And I'm like, this is not like you can't just like grab the person of color and like assign them into this like box because it's uncomfortable for them too. Like and obviously like in a play setting, like you want to be in the play and you want like a good role, but like you don't want it to be like a problematic thing. I don't know. Like, since you've been in, like, a lot of plays, like, how would you deal with being cast in that kind of role? I mean, when I was in Sparrow, Tony talked about this. He was our director, and he was a Black person. And he talked about, like, colorblind casting and how, like, because we had a Black woman who was playing the mother of a white character. Mm -hmm. He had, like, a female character playing a male, and he was like, that's not an issue. But if it's a play specifically, like, if it was Hairspray, that's not appropriate because it's a play about race or like if it focused specifically on gender, then that's not okay to do. So I think like if I was cast as the black woman in Hairspray, the, um, the one who was played by Queen Latifah and like sings the amazing oh, song. Right. I like, I would be flattered, but I would also be like, mm, no, I can't like morally do that. Right. Cause it's the equivalent of like Tracy Turnblatt being played by like a skinny girl. Yes, and, like, they did that. Like, they put her in a fat suit. Yeah. It just feels super weird and inauthentic to the character beyond everything else, like, beyond the fact that it's also, like, being culturally insensitive. Yeah, and when I was in high school, we were talking about casting, and one of the people who was an administrator, like, in charge of casting was saying, like, he was complaining about this girl who auditioned for a role, and from what I understand, she did very well in her audition, but they didn't cast her as Fiona in Shrek because she was overweight. And he was like, well, that's just common sense. Like, you can't be Fiona if you're overweight. And I'm like, I thought the whole point was that she doesn't have to, like, look a certain... Like, she's an ogre. She's green. You don't have to cast someone who you find attractive to play Fiona. And that didn't make a lot of sense to me. Mm-hmm. And, like, I don't know. Are, how familiar are you with Legally Blonde? Oh, Legally Blonde is my entire life. It's like, the reason... I, like, started getting into the field of law, for sure. Oh, that's exciting. (laughs) I just remember, like, watching Legally Blonde growing up with my my parents. Like, all of us were so into it. Like, and, like, Legally Blonde the musical as well. Like, we know all of the songs. We're, like, super into, like, the the whole plot of, like, this, like, excitable, like, peppy girl being, like, I'm going to go to law school today. Okay, so you know the character who's like, look at my ass, look at my thighs, yeah, and she's yeah. supposed to be bigger. Yeah. They cast the skinniest girl yeah. that they could find for yeah. that role. And, like, when we were in forensics, and Heathers, do you know Heathers? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, Martha, who is, like, a huge part of her character is that she's overweight. They mm-hmm. mention it in the script. Yeah. And they cast, like, the skinniest girl that they could find. I don't understand. I think that it's because they're scared of casting people and calling them fat. By casting them in a fat character. So when you cast a skinny person, you're like, oh, obviously you're not fat. I feel like, I don't know, that's why it's so important to have people, like, audition for the roles that they feel comfortable doing, I think. And not just have people doing, like, an open role call for that kind of thing. I feel like if you have some, if you're going out for that role, then you know you're comfortable, like, playing into some of the stereotypes that, like, exist with it. Because, like... You don't want, like, I guess, I guess you wouldn't want to call anyone out, but at the same time, like, you want people who actually fit the role and the description the way that, like, the writer of the script intended. Yeah, and a lot of people call out the actresses or the actors in that role, and I feel like that's something that you should be saying to the casting people and to the directors, because a lot of people, like, especially if it's something that's filmed, like, you have no idea what it's going to end up looking like or how it's going to turn out when you're doing it. Because a lot of that happens in post and in editing. And, like, it makes me think of the Kendall Jenner Pepsi situation. And, like, I look at the scenes that she specifically was in. And I'm like, what if she thought that this was going to be something completely different? And then 
it, she like saw it released and was like, oh no. Yeah. I guess you don't like have any control over that whatsoever. Like you, you just agree to it. And then I think there's like some people though who have like come out and like, like there's examples of like when people's bodies have been edited and they like go to a shoot or whatever. And they, they see that like by the time the cover comes out, their body's been edited. And then they, like, come forward later and they, like, ask for the original image and then they, like, post that image. I think, like, that's the best way of, like, dealing with, like, giving some sense of, like, what's reality? Like, what part, what actual role did they want to have in this? And then, like, because we see the role that they actually ended up having, but sometimes we miss the, like, what role did they think they were going to be having? Have you seen the Solange Knowles thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think uh, Bella Thorne, actually, I know she's been, like, doing a lot of stuff lately, but Bella Thorne, like, recently came out with a cover where she had, like, no Photoshop done, and, like, she wrote this, like, whole description about how, like, she asked them to not do Photoshop, and then they did, like, minor Photoshop, and then she came out later and was, like, this is what my full body looks like. She's, like, I'm scared to do this, but, like, we gotta start doing this type of thing. And she has, like, an amazing perfect body, so, like, I don't know that, like, that was, like, the biggest, like, plunge into the darkness, but, like, still, it's brave, or, like, why is it even brave? That's also a weird thing to Yeah, me. and people criticize Bella Thorne so much, I guess, just because she is, like, open about her sexuality or whatever, but, like, leave her alone. Like, I don't understand. Like, on the note of her sexuality, this is, like, such a tangent from, like, what we're discussing, but um, she has, like, basically, like, low-key come out as bisexual, and, like, no one's, like, talking about that, like, like, she's having, like, relationships with both women and men, and everyone's kind of just, like, oh, she's doing it for the views, but, like, no one's being, like, hey, your identity's valid, like, and it's very strange to me. They're, like, she's a party girl, so her identity's not valid, like. I don't understand, like, why would you have relationships with both women and men as a press thing? Because I feel like that's just going to get you more unwanted criticism than anything else yeah I don't think she's like faking it by any means I think she's just like being cognizant that like sexuality is a spectrum and everyone's like she's trying to get views and I'm like why why are we looking at it this way why can't we like assume the best in people and assume that people are doing things like authentically yeah and like bio representation is so exciting yeah like um I don't know if you watch Game of Thrones but they mm-hmm. had like two characters come on who were both like openly bi and I was so very excited and then one of them got killed off immediately like two episodes after he appeared and I was like why did you do this to me he's not here anymore but it was like really great representation while it was there yeah have you seen um the bold type have you seen that show not there is such an amazing bisexual character she's like fully developed as a human and like it's wild because she has this relationship with a woman but at the beginning of um the series you see that she like identifies as straight and she's very adamant about it but then you see her like start to settle into this role and she's trying to talk to her friends about it and they're like very accepting people but like they're not really fully hearing her and they're like well you've always liked men and you've dated men and you like men and she's kind of just like yeah but, like now I've met this woman I'm interested in and yeah. by the end of the series you kind of I don't want to like do any spoilers but like by the end of the series, like, she really comes into her bisexuality, and I'm, like, she has dimension. She's, like, super <laughs> interesting, and it is more than just her sexual identity. What is this mainstream culture? That's awesome. Yeah, that's one big problem that I have with Orange is the New Black. I haven't watched, like, the seasons that are more recent, but, like, Piper, for example, is very clearly bisexual, because she's, like, dated Alex in the past, but she's also was engaged to this guy and was, like, in true, like, actual relationships with both of them, but they never mention that she's bisexual. Like, they use gay and straight and, like, never actually mention any, like, anything else. And I think that they could do a lot better when it comes to representation. Like, I, I watched a an interview with the cast, and they we're talking like they had done this big amazing like revolutionary thing and I'm like "Mm, I don't know about that like it was an important show because it it showed like what things are like in women's prisons and a lot of things that need to change but I feel like they could have done a lot better and instead of like pushing to do better going forward they're just like patting themselves on the back like yeah we did the thing yeah yeah I feel like that happens a lot 
when, especially when, like, I think people get excited about, like, different representations of sexuality, but they don't think about, <coughs> like, how, like, those are evolving. So, like, I guess time is back to the actual, the topic <laughs> of this. Um, like, they're, they're trying to be, like, good allies, but unless the story is being told by the people experiencing it, I think it's hard to give, like, a fully encompassing, like, story of someone's sexuality. Yeah, like, um, for example, with 13 Reasons Why, I noticed, like, people were huge fans of that show, but none of the people who were, like, into it were people who have actually experienced anything relating to the topics that are covered, because they don't, they didn't do it responsibly. Mm. And, like, people were like, no, it's, like, spreading awareness, but it's not doing it right. And I feel like your art isn't good art if it can't be consumed by the people that it's about. I think that's, like, very, very true, and that, like, the people who, like, it would be too painful to watch for, like, the people who, like, maybe need it most or who, like, could potentially get the most from it. Like, it's really only, like, loved by people who can handle it and can take it on, and those people are, like, less likely to actually have to deal with, like, the pain of all of it, so that's tough. And what kills me about it, I don't know if you know this, but, like, while they were in the process of making the series, they contacted the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention and, like, talked to those people and were like, how do we do this responsibly so that they could say that they did? And then they just ignored every bit of the advice that was given to them. And, like, they had her kill herself on screen and they, like, dramatized her. I hated that. I didn't, I don't, I didn't really see the point of that because we all know from the series that she dies, like, I don't understand why they had to have because I feel like it isn't that dramatic like sometimes you don't see anything and they made it so much like the stereotype of how you picture suicide and not actually ever getting into like the different ways that like it can happen I don't know not that like there's one way to do it by any means but like it's just the way they did it is like so expected and so, like, aggressive, I guess. And and also the way that it showed the sexual assault was so, like, s- like stereotype of what a sexual assault is in a lot of ways. And it, like, kind of didn't feel authentic because of that. I don't know. The whole show's... I mean, like, I, I there's parts of it, obviously, that are beneficial. But, like, I think on whole, it's, it's missing a lot of pieces and hurting a lot of people through the process. I feel like a lot of it was not... Like, we're trying to portray this responsibly. It was, like, we're trying to get viewers. Because they were doing all of the, like, teen drama, stereotypical things. And then it would be, like, by the way, I'm dead. Dun, dun, dun. And, yeah, like, yeah. that's not that's not what you need. We have moved so far away from the topic. That's okay. <laughs> that's... Or to be, I mean, like, this is all on the subject of, like, being an ally and, like, what it looks like. And, like, appreciating like cultural sources of being an ally, I guess. <laughs> Me summarizing. Okay, I have a story that fits with this topic. Okay. I am in a creative writing class where like I have come into my first contact with like non-binary people mm-hmm. and I've never met anybody who was non-binary before. And I um, forgot to use they pronouns with one of them at some point. I referred to them as him and they were like deeply uncomfortable and I could like tell, but we were in the middle of class and I didn't want to like stop it and be like, I'm so sorry. Like, I don't know what to do. And so I wrote them like a note and I was like, I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to. And they're like, you don't need to apologize. Like, I'm just glad that you're trying to do better. And I think that that's, I don't know, that's the way to do it. Because, like, people have been that way towards me in, like, some of the things that I've experienced. Like, people don't treat trauma survivors the way that they should Mm -hmm. a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. And, like, there was this guy in my class who wrote a piece about, like, figurative death. And, like, when something bad happens to you, you die on the inside, but, like, not really. His dad divorced his mom and he was like referring to it in the past tense but he referred to it as like after my dad killed himself and so I read that and I was like no no (laughs) and um I talked to him about it I was like you that's not okay like my dad actually killed himself and you can't do that and so he like took it out and he apologized and like that's how you should deal with something like that, I think. Because if somebody who, like, experienced it firsthand that's telling you, like, this is not cool, then you should probably believe them. I think on 
on that note, I remember, like, this was, like, about a year ago-ish when I was, like, talking to my mom about my sexuality and, like, how I define that. She did not react the way that I would have expected considering, like, she's extremely liberal and, like, very progressive and, like, very open to hearing, like, different perspective and she was like doing a lot of the are you sure and like asking me to explain and like that's all well and good but like I think it's so much more important to like do research when like something like that happens and like instead of like forcing the person to like explain their specific like experience with you know whatever gender or sexual identity like it's it's important to like do your own separate research but at the time she was just kind of like didn't think that it was real and so she like kind of ignored it and then um more recently she was like asking me questions that actually showed that like she valued my identity like um she started saying like so like have you been on any dates with any people instead of being like what guys are you talking to um and I've noticed like my entire family has like started doing that like they've been like seeing anyone and it's so easy to make that switch and like being a good ally is like figuring out the way that's going to make the person feel the most comfortable and the most like supported and like I don't know that just like happened like about a week ago but it like made me super happy because it all being an ally is is like listening and hearing and like I was also thinking with the Me Too campaign that's been going around a lot of I don't know this is a question for you and how you like to be supported I guess but like I've been getting asked a lot like what do you need from like the men in my life like what do you need because I saw you post a Me Too status so like what would you say to, like, people asking that question? I mean, I was really scared to post my Me Too because I hadn't seen it. Like, this was before a lot of people started posting it everywhere, Mm -hmm. and I was like, people are going to think bad things about me. And, like, nobody really did anything. And I guess what I would tell to any male person is just to be, like, more observant and, like, watch out for it happening because it has happened in front of you, like, Mm -hmm. I promise. And to just, like, call it out when it does happen. I think the language is so interesting because, like, it does happen right in front of their eyes. And, like, I think the way you respond is so important. I was actually, so I'm, for, like, one of my classes, I'm doing a research project, and um, it's kind of looking at how, like, pornography plays into rape culture, and so, like, through my research, of course, the articles I'm reading are, like, super dark, but, like, basically, like, research suggests that, like, if you surround yourself with men who have um, been abusive towards women or aggressive towards women, you are more likely to take on some of those behaviors. Like, it has been, like, shown that, like, it, people who surround themselves with men who are abusive and like part of the rape culture already they become part of it and they become the language they use about women becomes different so like there's more like body evaluation language and like more objectification of women in general so like calling out when you hear that objectification even if it's a, if it's a small thing talking about you know like a woman's body just you know in any way just like be cognizant of like like, if you're a man or, like, male identifying, it's it's so easy to be like, well, what do you mean by that? And then they're forced to, you know, actually explain themselves. I always, we, we teach that in orientation, like, when someone's being prejudiced, say, like, what do you mean by that? Because then they have to explain their prejudice, which there's often no explanation. So One example of great allyship that I have witnessed, um, I was being, like, sexually harassed when I was in high school. And I was just, like, walking down the hallway, and this guy kept touching me, and I was saying, like, no, like, stop, leave me alone. And this guy, who I did not know, and I don't think that he knew us, um, came up to him and was like, she said to stop, like, you need to stop. And I, like, I was out of there, like, I left, I don't know what happened afterwards, but I am very thankful that he did that. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's an example of, like, treating people the way that you should. Um, we were actually, like, talking about this campaign in one of my other classes. Like, all my classes, like, have been talking about the Me Too campaign, which I think is, like, super interesting. Um, and I guess it's, like, part of the liberal arts education mm-hmm. you get, like, talking about real stuff. But we were talking about this, and the, one of the professors, she's a female professor in the politics department, so, like, there's not a lot of those. And she was kind of talking about a lot of the times that she had been, like, sexually harassed and and um, assaulted by people in her life and I was like found myself being like so shocked which is like wild because obviously I realized like women 
this is like something that happens, but like we can be allies to each other and like believing those stories, you know, even if it's somebody who you see as an authority figure, like your belief in their story matters. Like even if someone seems like older than you and like they're probably fine and like they've processed through it, like she told us later that she appreciated that we all like were there to listen to our stories because people haven't for so many years. Like, and that just shows like how big the problem this is because it's been going on since she was a little kid. Okay, so we have hit time. <laughs> so, um, okay, you're going to ask me a question and I am going to only respond with terrible advice. Okay, question on this topic? Yes. Okay, so um, somebody comes up to you and they are wearing like a costume of like a mariachi hat and like a uh, poncho and they're like I'm a Mexican person like what do you like how like is this a good outfit should I wear this for Halloween isn't this like super cute like what do you say okay not only should you tell them that it's a great idea you should go up to the nearest Hispanic person and be like no you should explain to them why it's a bad idea this is your job definitely um okay and then the last thing we're gonna do is give the readers a last piece of terrible advice. And like Emily gave good advice during this. Don't do that. It confuses <laughs> the listeners. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so this Halloween, um, I really want to see everyone who listens to this podcast dressed up in like the most offensive thing they can find. Just like think of like the culture that's being like most oppressed in like today's society. Just like like, if Trump has said something offensive about them, throw their costume on, throw it on, and just, like, think of every stereotype you have and just use whatever accents you need, <laughs> use whatever accessories help you perpetuate that stereotype, and, you know, look people dead in the eyes when you, like, say things that are just, like, wildly offensive. Really, really dig it in. Get it really good. <laughs> Okay, um, my piece of terrible advice. The next time you see a Me Too post, comment and be like, not you, actually. I don't believe you. It didn't happen. I hate <laughs> just hearing you say that. <laughs> it's terrible advice. Not really. <laughs> don't actually do any of these things. <laughs> and on that note... I'll see you guys next Sunday. Tune in next time to our next episode of Yikes. Bye.